The following culture and episode is part two of two on the top 10 trends in the future of work with your Human Works 8 hosts, Sean Gullius and Jason Cochran. Listen in as they cover trends six through 10 in this episode to close out this two-part series. Hello, Googleization Nation, and welcome to Culture and the Future of Workplace Culture a GGG Unleashed podcast with thought leaders, Human Works 8. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. In each of Human Works 8's episodes, we will cover practical insights, tips, and executable activities to get you thinking about the future of culture development in your organization. Let's begin. And that's going to roll right into the next one here. So from Evolving Leadership Practices, number six is we got to develop some new skills for the future of work. <laughs> the shelf life of things we've learned in the past, we need to constantly be upskilling and reskilling on those. What are some skills that you're hearing folks are working on, or maybe some that you're working on yourself, Sean, as you're evolving and adapting as well? You know, one of the leadership skills or foundational beliefs I have around strong leaders is actually coming from a place of gratitude. I believe a gratitude practice is a business practice. You know, I've been challenged on that. Sometimes I speak about that at conferences and people say, Sean, that's, that's like Oprah. You're, you're, you're going very soft on us. <laughs> and, and I believe some of these new practices are really coming from how do you make leaders really comfortable and authentic and who they are from that interview, but also then how do they show that to others? And one of those is through a gratitude practice. And we do a lot of work in building that into leadership programs. And another one that I that I wanted to highlight is really around caring. And you know, I, you know, I, I tease people when they and then they're looking for people leaders and in interview processes and they say well you know you ask the person you know do you care about people and somebody says well of course you know for a job i have to care about people i'm a leader i care but, but then when you take it a little step deeper and so where has that caring and looking at people really changed somebody at work or in your life that's what you're looking for in a leader that really take that caring to really help another individual at work thrive or take the next step that you're putting that extra effort. I always say being a leader takes extra energy, extra effort. Um, it doesn't come naturally. You have to put that energy out there. So just two things I would highlight is what, what training are you doing around gratitude and that practice and how a leader can really use that to build relationships? And then I know caring sounds soft, but it's an active thing. What are you doing to help your leaders care? Sometimes that's really just do your leaders have in one-on-one -on -one conversations great questions to really show that they're interested and, and concerned about work items as well as life items? Show that you care. Show that commitment. I love that. And, and it's a good reminder, too, showing care in 2023 and heading into 2024. There may be some new different ways to do that for your people than what you were doing in 2015 or 2010. Got so it. it's just a good practice to continually be thinking freshly with those new skills. Some things are timeless, right? Like some of the greatest rock kits and things like that. But there's, there's other things that there might be some new exciting ways that we can show care to our people as leaders, the more that we get to know them. Trend number seven, intergenerational collaboration. I can't believe I'm saying this, Sean, but we currently have five generations in the workforce. Traditionalist, <laughs> Boomer, Gen X, Millennials, and Gen Z. And one day, as we continue to extend the longevity of life, we may have six generations in the workplace. How do we go about helping those that may be at either end of the spectrum work cohesively as a team across all those generations? Yeah, you know, here's what I, I believe. I love that this is one of my favorites in your top 10, actually, Jason, because I, I think organizations are not calling an intergenerational collaboration. I think sometimes they look at it as, okay, we need to do succession planning or we need to you know, do training. And if they twisted that to the future and said, what does our intergenerational collaboration look like? How would that help with training and development? How can you use the expertise of anybody, what, no matter where you are and all those names and different labels of different generations there, but what can a, an earlier generation teach a later generation? And how do you set that up as a positive in your culture and build that into your practices? I think that could solve succession planning. 
Let me tell you, I think there's something around there that already that's built in. Also, when you think about, especially, I don't know, I don't even know what, I think I'm called a boomer these days. I think I'm still in that boomer generation. <laughs> But when I look at organizations, one thing we are also guiding them to think about is that expertise. Oftentimes, it's not captured. And that's when all of a sudden, when somebody with a lot of expertise is, is moving on and taking the next step in their life, that expertise sometimes gets lost. One of the things about intergenerational collaboration, I believe, is really having everybody along the level really documenting and really noting what they're doing, how they're doing it. So it's sort of like a history is captured, whether that's efficiency in process, whether that's efficiency in knowledge. Um, I, I often think we love people no matter where you are as far as their expertise and the, their great talents, but we don't think well enough about that. Okay, how can what somebody knows? be useful over here. And I, I think calling it and really labeling it different from an HR perspective, like this intergenerational collaboration, I would love to see that more in people's three-year picture as they're doing strategy and planning to the future. Twist it a little bit, see how it helps your training and development programs, as well as your thoughts around succession planning. I love that. And that is bold. And <laughs> knowing you, I love that you are not bashful in being bold, that Let's move away from succession planning and think about intergenerational collaboration. How we get everyone to yeah. work well together because yeah. that is the future. We think five is a lot now because we used to have four. We probably will push into six generations working together in the workforce one day in some capacity. And so we have to figure out how we do that well. And one of the, the ideas I've heard about is that each generation, each person in each generation, you not only get to be a mentor, you get to be a mentee. So you're you not only it. teaching and dispensing wisdom, but you're learning as well from, from the others. And that's going to be really important. And the other thing too, just to point this out for, for organizations, I know right now for some, there's been a push in thinking about boomer generations in retirement. And maybe sometimes there have been some leaders guilty of thinking, oh, we kind of want to encourage them to retire and bring <laughs> in some younger generations. Just a word of caution around that. We now have a lot of research around certain types of skills that people have cognitive skills. And there are certain skills cognitively that do not peak for humans until they're in their 70s. Certain types of experiential wisdom, certain types of creativity. And so I'd like to challenge us to also think, instead of thinking, oh, we just get to a certain age of retirement and then leave, like there's still tremendous value we can learn from the older generations because of certain cognitive skills that actually peak in those years. And instead of thinking, oh, do we need to rush certain people out the door? Let's turn that around and say, what can we learn from them? What should we be learning from them because of their unique skill set that's peaking at this age of life? And Jason, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking right to me. I don't know if you meant that for me because Oh, you know, maybe no, no. I should be retiring as far as that goes. <laughs> but what I believe at the same time, I believe I'm doing some of my best thinking right now. You know, it took me this long to get there to your point. So I'm a living example of what you just said. And I, and I do believe sometimes we forget that, that, that passing along of information and really how that, that cognitive knowledge builds until finally then wow, now I've come up with this discovery, this innovation, or you're looking, you're able to sort of look at things in a lot of different ways based on your past experience. I love that thought, Jason. Absolutely. And that also goes for the younger generations too. Definitely. There's things that you can teach. You need to be learning, but there's things that you can also teach some of the older generations as well. So everybody having that open mindset to learn from one another and create an environment of continuous improvement and learning is really important. We're going to roll into trend number eight here. Number eight is we're going to start moving beyond just measuring productivity. A lot of the ways we've just tr traditionally measured business success and results, those are going to evolve and change. This isn't me saying it. This is coming from one of the top research firms, Deloitte. In fact, an interesting thing that came out from them when they were looking at value creation in businesses, this fascinated me, 63% of the work that creates value inside organizations by people falls outside of folks' job description. <laughs> I'll repeat that, 63% falls outside of the job description in terms of the value creation. So it turns out, leaders, when you're putting those job descriptions out to find talent and bring them in, 
that little line that says, and other duties and responsibilities <laughs> as designated, it turns out that's 63% of the value compared to the 37% of the other things you have listed. Sean, as we start entering into this new way of thinking about value creation in organizations, how can we go about helping leaders think beyond just the traditional measures of like productivity? You know, one way to think about that, I, I think that's it's, it's that talk about one of the things that you said was terrifying, a little scary when you think about that. If you were not thinking about the value adds up, let's say even relationship building, how are you measuring that? That to, That's one of those value adds, you know, the, the people that are thriving and adding the greatest value in that last line of that job description, it, your job description is probably not talk about how are you as a relationship builder in your organization? How are you in that collaboration, bringing people together? How is that working? I also think it's all around how measuring how you're using talent in your organization. A lot of times we think about talents from a very sort of siloed kind of view. This person does this. But in this collaboration and this needing for teamwork moving forward into 2024 and beyond, we need to really get the right people in the right room and understanding how those talents work together and measuring the efficiency and the produ production of teams when the right talents are in the room, rather than just sort of saying, hey, this person does this, here's what it is. We're not really you know, measuring the right thing and we're also just sort of siloing in on a certain talent. So I think that collaborative and bringing people together, relationship building, I think is one. And then the third one I would say, as far as measuring, how are you measuring your efficiency in documenting and process improvement, Jason? I think that's another element that, we find you know, we're working a lot with organizations, just helping them for the first time, just simply documenting some of their core processes so they can build efficiencies, so they can, they can look at them objectively and say, oh, we need to stop doing that. Now that we see it on paper, this is the way it works, how can we build efficiencies into it or stop doing it? And again, I think that's a, a measure that a lot of organizations don't think about. They're, they're, they're measuring sort of that, that, that trailer, that end product, rather than that beginning thing on what is the process that our team members or this part of what we do, how it works. I love it. And that flows perfectly into trend number nine too, Sean, <laughs> which is it's an area in your sweet spot. The future work is going to be about how do we make sure we're setting people up successfully in terms of being in the zone when they're working. So we're talking about how do we help them get in the flow? We're talking about conation, which may be a new word for some folks that they're hearing for the first time. Help us understand how, how do we in the future start thinking better around people, around the three parts of their mind and how we set them up to be doing the types of work that gets them in the flow with their natural instincts and ways of doing things. Yeah, but you're speaking my love language there, you know, Jason, as far as, as far as this one, because one of our foundational pieces, and you know this, how we work and how we start with any organization is really thinking well about people across those three parts of the mind, the cognitive, the affect, as well as the cognitive. And a lot of people know the cognitive and that expertise, and that's a big part of who we are. And people think about that personality and that those, those personality drivers and passions and desires that drive us. But they forget to get true flow or to get in that zone. You have to be working from your natural instincts. And that's that cognitive part of the brain. We use that, that assessment tool called Colby. And we're really well-versed and experts in that Colby theory and helping individuals, teams really understand what are those natural drivers from the gut that if I'm free to do it my way, what is my way? And understanding that, that's when you get in the flow. Because if you don't get that, you're seeing, I'm sure people on this call, you might be feeling yourself when you're working against the grain. You're working against, oh, this just doesn't feel right. That's because you're working against your natural instincts. Go with your gut is what we always say. When you're working against the grain, that's strain. And it's one of the biggest drivers of people leaving a role, a company, a position outside of a, a, maybe a leader would be that strain capacity. And another element about that cognitive part of the brain is that also tension, it may be something that's happening in your organization or between people. And that happens from a leader and an individual who doesn't understand this cognitive part of the brain. Tension happens when a leader is trying to drive a person to do it a certain way, which is again, 
against their natural way of wanting to do it. Leaders understanding that, individuals understanding that, that helps get your team in the zone, in that flow. That also supports what you're talking about, putting teams together, putting the right dif- dif- the right cognitive abilities together really helps a project team get in the zone in the same way. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is something I've learned since joining the team in August. The team has helped me understand myself better from that perspective, because I, I may have had like an inkling of maybe the things that that just naturally give me energy. But now I have like a full picture view of it since having taken my Colby and and then understanding it within the context of our team. And one of the things I know is if you want me to go against the grain really quickly, put financial spreadsheets in front of me and I'm against the grain big time. And my EEG <laughs> looks like scrambled eggs. How there about for you, you Sean? What's, what's something for you that would be against the grain? If I have to prep about a week ahead of time, that would drive me crazy. I'm working against the grain for me. Last minute energy is what works with the way I work. I'm not afraid for a little bit of uh, risk and uncertainty when I jump into something. And actually that risk and uncertainty gives me a little extra sort of effort and energy going into something. So don't make me plan a week ahead and do a lot of research that far ahead because my brain goes crazy because that's mine. Well, I love that. And one of the things, too, that I appreciate about you is you always leave room for serendipity. I like to do the same. Leave room for those unexpected, wonderful things in life that you can't plan. You got it. You and I are similar that way, cognitively, Jason. I like that. Absolutely. I can't believe we've made it all the way to number 10. All Sean, right, but number here 10. we are. Number 10. Here we go. Thinking in the future of work. If you're an HR leader, we're speaking specifically for you now. Thinking in terms of managing a portfolio of investments where you're directing your HR resources and that what's right for your organization may be different than another organization. So if you take a step back, think about your retirement portfolio, where you're investing, you have goals that are probably very different than someone else. And you wouldn't just want to carbon copy that. It seems like sometimes in HR, we get caught up sometimes in, oh, this other organization and they're investing big time in this particular type of new engagement survey. We need to go do that too. Instead of taking a step back and really understanding what's right for us, what delivers the most return on investment, where should we be investing those resources in HR? And that's just going to become more important in the future of work because there will continue to be just more and more solutions providers out there that you have to think well about does this align with who we are and where we're trying to go? And so having some good, uh, having a good barometer in place to understand that's really important. Sean, what are some words of wisdom you can share around helping HR leaders think well about how they're investing their resources in HR? You know, I believe there needs to be some sort of foundational strategy to think about. And we don't have time today to go through what, how we help organizations look at that, but we call it the 12 people touch points. And at least you have 12 items where you sort of say, these are the most critical things that touch everyone in your organization. And how are we then investing financially into those areas and which one is our greatest need or challenge now, which one may be to the future. Let me just give you a couple examples that we're hearing where we see larger investments being happening with a lot of our organizations. One is through the strategy and planning process. How are they doing that well? How is it being communicated across the organization? We always say when you're doing it internally, sometimes you get caught up and in, in the process itself. I always say get an objective outside person to come in you focus on the business let them run the process for you let them put together the communications for you so then you have can focus on how to bring that strategy and plan to life in a very clear way that everyone in your organization can see their line of sight to it that's one of the 12 touch points another one would be communication And I believe if you don't have a person that's really your communication expert on your team, that's really thinking about communication from really a 365 approach, how are you communicating every single day throughout the year to your organization? There's a lot of elements and that needs an investment, I believe, to the future, both in people and potentially then in different methods and technologies that you can use that are that align best with your organization that way. So those are two things I would call out strategy and planning investment, as well as your communication investment. I love that. 
And it's perfect timing as we get ready to wrap up. This has gone by way too quickly, but the insights here have been absolutely valuable for our listeners today. So what I'm going to do, Sean, before I kick it back over to you as you wrap us up, I'm just going to hit that top 10 list again so that folks hear it one more time and know what that is. And then we'll wrap it up with him. So number one, future work trend is work autonomy, people wanting more freedom in a variety of ways. Number two, we're moving from jobs to meaningful work. So folks, that means we've got to lead and create workplaces where people want to show up beyond just getting a paycheck. Number three, workplace mental health and well-being. As you heard, the federal government now is stepping in. The Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Surgeon General, saying that this is reaching kind of public health crisis levels, and we've got to make sure we've got good processes in place to support workplace mental health. And then number four was Metaverse, AI, and Web3. We've got a lot of technology change. We've got to start thinking well about and making sure it's part of our strategic planning and that we uh, do well around that. Number five, evolving leadership practices. Some of the practices, things maybe that we've done in the past that have worked well in the industrial age, in the post-industrial age, maybe those things are going to have to be modified or tweaked in some ways. So those things are changing too. Number seven, all of us have to learn new skills for the future of work. The shelf life of, of skills now on average is about four years, and that might actually continue to drop. It might get smaller and smaller. So we've got to continuously learn and improve our practices. And then we've also got to make sure we're putting intergenerational collaboration practices in place too, which is the next trend. That's number seven. So with five generations in the workplace, potentially pushing into six, We've got to focus on intergenerational collaboration, not just succession planning. Number eight, we've got to think beyond productivity. Yes, we're not saying productivity is not important anymore. It is, but we've got to make sure we're focusing on the leading indicators of wellness for people and the systems we design and work to help people do their best work and feel great about it. Number nine, we're talking about flow and conation. How do we get people working more in the zone? We've got to make sure we're focusing on that. And then lastly, the portfolio management and HR. Thinking about where you invest your resources as an HR leader is really important. And don't get distracted. And just because another company over here may be putting a lot of money into something doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right choice for you. Know your organization and your people well to be a good steward and custodian of where you invest those resources. So that was the top 10 list on the future of work from Human Works 8. Sean, as we wrap up, what do you have for folks? Well, Jason, I'm just grateful. The way you're wired, you're always thinking ahead. And so your future view and you're always ahead and, and thinking well about what's going to help people and organizations move forward. And I, I'm glad you thought about these top 10, put them together to get really get people sort of thinking ahead. And it's perfect timing as people sort of get their 2024 or their three-year picture sort of together in their strategy and plan. So thanks, thanks for joining me and sort of guiding me down this path because it's been good thinking on my part too. I'm hoping everyone gained an insight or two. Don't hesitate to reach out to Jason or myself. It's a lot to cover in one little podcast. So if you want to go in deeper into the top 10 future ways of thinking about work, or if you want to learn more about these 12 touch points, maybe that's a foundational sort of tool that could help you as you look in 2024. Reach out. We're here. You got us. And Look forward to us next month as we continue our GGG Unleashed podcast here. And I don't know what we'll be talking about, but I bet you're going to gain at least one insight. So thanks, Jason. Everybody have a great wrap up to this year and happy holidays to everybody. That's a wrap for part two, where Sean and Jason cover trends six through 10 for the future of work. Thank you for tuning in and check out humanworks8.com to learn more.